Now, today we're going to start a new series. We are going to uh, go into a series called Castaway. How many of you remember the movie Castaway? All right, this is not it. This isn't about Tom Hanks. This isn't about Wilson. Uh, this, is, this is the story of Jonah. Okay, so hopefully you're there by now. And even if you did not grow up in church, you have heard the story of Jonah and the whale, right? If you're from the deep south, it's Jonah and the whale. And, and I always tell my wife, he didn't fall in a well. He went into a fish. <laughs> Some people say a whale. No, big fish. Could have been a whale. We don't know for sure. But we know it was a great fish. We're going to show you some things today, help you understand the setting of the book, and kind of get used to, uh, to what's here and how it applies to us. I believe this. The Bible is applicable even to us today. This is not just uh, an old, outdated book of fairy tales and stories. The Bible has been proven true over and over and over again. It's been proven to be a supernatural book. People say, Pastor, why do you think your religion is the right one? <laughs> because of this. Because I serve a God that's no longer in a tomb. You go to visit where, where uh, he was laid, and it's empty. That's why I believe what I believe. That's why I believe what, what we're teaching is true. So when we get to stories like this in the Bible... It's probably one of the most controversial. Uh, some wonder, could the story uh, really be true? Is it literal or is it figurative? Well, I would ask you, do you interpret the Bible just as, as a figurative book, a book of fairy tales, or do you really believe the things in Scripture happened? I believe they happened. Did a fish really swallow a man? Is that even possible? If the Bible says that I believe it, did it happen? Could Jonah really live to tell about it? Bible says it. I believe it. Is the story a myth? No, we believe it really happened. The answer is no. So when the Bible is taken literally, it brings a whole different perspective on this. Understand this as well. It, he's listed in a lineage. He's the son of Amatei. Uh, Jesus talked about this story and referenced it back. Jesus wasn't just referencing a fairy tale. It, this is a historical fact. Matthew records it. Luke records it. So as we go into this, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page and we understand this isn't just some figurative story. This really happened. So why would God put this story in the scriptures? How does it apply today? Well, you begin to look and it's about a man. Uh, it's about a person that's, that's running from the Lord. The whole story, you realize there's only like three verses in the whole book, three or four verses in the entire book that even talk about the fish. So we've, we've taken four chapters, and we always tell the, the story of Jonah and the whale, and really that's not even what the story is about. That's just one thing that happened during the story. Now I thought, how do, how do we really apply this? How do we put it all together? I, I thought about really, really jazzing this thing up a little bit. I was going to call Pastor Robert, except he was on vacation this week. I said, man, this would be great. We take Paul McCartney's old song, and instead of band on the run, it's man on the run. That's Jonah. You'd never forget that, right? It's man on the run. That's, that's who Jonah is. Well, how does it apply to today? We're running. Every one of us is running from something. People are running from life's issues. They don't like what's happening in their world, so they're running. They don't like what's happening on their job, so they're quitting. They don't like what's happening in their neighborhood, so they're moving. They, don't, they, they take all these things and they run, run, run. A problem arises, they run. A situation comes up, they run. In the world, as we talked through Daniel, it's called mad. People are running. They say, man, get me somewhere safe. Sometimes we're running from God. It's not running from things. It's not running from problems. It's not running from neighbors. It's not running from employers. It's, it's running from God. I believe this book is applicable today as much as it has ever been. And so thus the title, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> no way. So look in your bullets in this morning. There's an outline. We're going to start with the first point here, God's command. God's command, look at Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says this, Now the word of the Lord came to who? Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go where? All right, you just got most of what the story's about. God told a man to go to Nineveh, okay? That great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. We just talked about this in our connect group this morning. You realize that we don't talk in church as much about God's judgment. 
We don't talk much about wickedness and how God responds to that and discipline and all those different things. But you also understand that's what this whole book is about. I know it's not popular, it doesn't draw crowds, it doesn't build big churches and audiences, but it's in God's Word, so it's an important story. And if we live as Jonah lived, uh, there's some discipline coming. So let's learn from this this morning and not have to make the same mistakes. So let's look at the man. Who was Jonah? Who was he? 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25 sums it up for us. He was a prophet. He's a religious leader. He's a guy that was respected among the people. But here's the most important part. He was a man that was sent out on a mission. A man sent out on a mission. Isn't that what the church is? A group of people sent out on a mission? We've been given the same mission that Jonah was given. The only difference is God told him a specific place, and to us, he said, go into all the world. We've been given the mission. So where was Nineveh? That's where he was told to go. Where was it? Nineveh, if you were to look on today's map, would be the city of Mosul, Iraq. It's uh, up there near the Syrian border. Uh, it was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It was just a, a, a pretty impressive place. One of the oldest, most populated cities in the empire. Huge metropolitan area, cultural hub, uh, just great architecture. But it was a very wicked city, extremely wicked city. Now, when you understand this, let me tell you how brutal these guys were because this kind of sets the stage. Um, we're not quite there yet, but it's uh, Nineveh. You see where it's, it's up toward that top. We'll come back to that slide in just a minute. Um, Listen to this. This is the people of Nineveh. This is why Jonah struggled, okay? The Ninevites were known for when they would come in and conquer a city, they would literally impale the people. They would take these folks, and if you're not familiar with impaling, there's a stake. It's stood upright, sharpened on the end, and they would stick them across that pole to where that stake would go right up through under their chest cavity, and they would bang them on that stake, and they'd set them out there. You weren't going anywhere. You're hanging out there flailing for all to see. And they didn't do it like way off on the side. That's some of the discussion on the cross. Was Jesus put way off on a, on a hill far away? That wasn't the Roman way. The Roman way was to put them right along the, the road because they wanted people to be intimidated. They wanted them to see what happened. They wanted them to get to a point to where they feared the government. Well, the Assyrians wanted people to fear them. It was like, hey... This is what we want you to see. What's going to happen to you if you don't listen to do and do what we say? You think that's bad? They would skin the people alive. Make a point? They'd take their skin and throw it up over the city wall for folks to come by and to see. This is the t these are the people that God said, hey, Jonah, you take this, this uh, message to these people. They were so brutal, they would take the, uh, they'd pull the tongues of those that they, they captured, they would pull them out, they'd have the people on the ground, they would literally drive a stake through their tongue to hold them into the ground and leave them out in the sun to bake to death. These are people that raped women, young girls, older people. These are the people that were so cruel, and they impacted Jonah's world, some of those that were people that he may have been related to as well. And and when you look at this, you, see, it's easy for us to read the story and go, hey, why wouldn't he go? You want to go there? You want to take a chance? You may or may not come back with skin on. You may or may not die with your tongue staked to the ground. Do you want to go to those people? And b besides that, if that didn't happen to you, why in the world should they get the opportunity to hear? Why should they hear the gospel? Why should that be something that's even offered to people that are that cruel? Why? God, what are you thinking? So it's real easy to go into this story and to say, well, Jonah just disobeyed. No, Jonah probably had a better reason than some of us throw out there as well. He knew what it was like. He knew, in his mind, he didn't think those people deserved to even hear of God's forgiveness. He said, I'm not going. God told him, these are the people I want you to go and preach to them, preach about their wickedness, because I want to give them an opportunity to repent. Jonah's going, they don't deserve an opportunity to repent. In his heart, as you go through this book, you're going to find out that really what Jonah's problem was is he didn't want them to have a second chance. He, in his heart, was so unforgiving, he thought, they don't deserve it, I don't want them to have it, God, I'm not doing it. So what happens? When God gives this command, oh, by the way, what's his command? What did he say? Two words. Arise, go. 
He didn't say, Jonah, let me, let me run this idea by you. Let me see what you think about this. Hey, Jonah, I know the, the world's gone crazy and there are some really wicked people out there. And, you know, you upset them in traffic and they pull a gun and, and now you're getting caught in crossfire. All you were doing was driving or you go to a parade and somebody shoots you or, you know, all these crazy things that are going on in our world. And God said, arise and go. I don't care what you think about the people. I don't care what they've done. Jonah, these people are wicked, but they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our world is wicked. Our world is in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Politics will never change this world. It's only going to divide it further. The only uniting thing in all the world is the message of the gospel. And we've got to be the ones who carry it out there. So what was Jonah's response? God said, arise, go. Jonah said, <laughs> I don't think so. Rebellion was his attitude. Now, whenever we're not following through on what God tells us, it's rebellion. When your kids, when your children are young, they're running around the couch, they trip over the cord, they knock over the lamp, do you punish them? Well, the first time, probably not. I mean, that's just what kids do, childish, right? They're running around. But then you tell them, hey, we're not going to run around the couch. Don't run behind it anymore. Do you see what happened? That could have broken don't run behind the couch. Guess what happens? The kids run around the couch again. First time was childishness. What's the second time? It's a choice. They knew, you warned them, you gave them the consequences. There was a choice to make. They made the wrong choice. Now there's discipline. You say, well, I just don't want to discipline my kids. Fine. They'll be part of our jail ministry in years to come. That's your choice. But here's the reality. You can teach them to do right, or you can just leave and let everything go. God said, not letting it go. Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, go ahead and throw that map back up there one more time. I want you to see this as we're talking about it here. Joppa is the way that it's worded here in our English Bible. Now, if you were to go over to Israel today, you're going to see Jaffa, J-A-F-F-A. -F -F -A. You're going to see Yafo, Y-A-F-O. That's the Hebrew way to say it. But Joppa, you see where it's located. You see Israel right there on the peninsula, just the top edge there. And now, look how close Nineveh is. He was going to take a ship, go up, and then travel across, right? That's all he's, he's got to do. But instead of going 550 miles, he makes an effort to go 2,500 miles away. Not real smart. But again, before we criticize Jonah, let me ask you, how many of you here, God's told you to do something, and you've run as far as you could? God asked you to start doing something, and you said, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. I don't want to have a part of it. You fill in the blank. What did you say when God said, I want you to do this with your life? I want you to do this in an area of ministry. I want you to do this in the way you serve. I want you to do this. And you went, no. There's no difference in your response and Jonah's response. The difference was he got on a ship. Some of you may have as well. But look at verse 10. His rebellion against God had consequences. Drop down or look real quick. Jonah's running impacted everybody on the ship. Your running from God is going to impact a lot of other people. If you're a parent, your impact is, your decision is going to have a consequence on your children. If you're a spouse, it's going to have a consequence on your spouse. If it's an employee, same thing, employer. If it's an employer, it's going to affect your employees. And you just begin to look in your family. If you're a son or daughter and you make a choice that lands you in a, in a particular area, it impacts your parents. Our sin always impacts others. Spiritual rebellion, because that's exactly what Jonah was doing, he was rebelling against what God told him to do, ends up with consequences that affect our families. Affairs, our spiritual issues. Pornography, spiritual issue. Our other things that we do in our lives. There are some things that you think, oh, you know, is this really against God? Embezzlement? You steal money from a company. Well, the Bible's real clear, thou shalt not steal. To me, that's a spiritual issue. And when we go through and we have these spiritual issues, it affects our children, our spouse, our siblings, our parents, our friends, our coworkers. It impacts everybody. And the rebellion that Jonah started with 
We, we do it. We just do it in different ways. So that he goes on. What else did Jonah do? Rebellion was the attitude, but running was his action. That's the part of this story that we really read all the way through each chapter. And remember this, attitudes always precede actions. His attitude toward God, his rebellion against what God told him to do, resulted in the action of running from God. But it didn't start in the action, it started in the attitude. You can run, but you can't hide. He said, preach, why do you keep saying that? Because we do it. We try to do this in our own lives. God is omnipresent. If you haven't heard that term before, it simply means this. He's everywhere. He is everywhere before you get there. Now, I'm not as fast as I used to be, and I've got limited time this morning. If I was as fast as I used to be, I might run all the way back there by, by where Rich is seated. I'd run back there. When I got there, hey, Rich, is God back there? He, he's already there. I can't run to that corner of the room and get away from him. I, I, I may go back here, Priscilla, if I run all the way back there. Is God already back there? Now, it would take me, see, see why I don't have time? If I ran all the way over there, and then I ran all the way over there. I, I run up into the balcony, and Eller's are, is God up there? I mean, if I run all the way up there, am I going to outrun God? Do you see how foolish Jonah was? He's going to go all the way to Tarshish, 2,500 miles away. Like God's not there. God is already there. When we understand this idea of omnipresence, when you get yourself in a situation and you show up somewhere and you engage in sin that you know is wrong, whether it's taking a little bit of money, whether it's taking someone else's wife, whether you get involved in whatever it is, God's there. You say, God's not there. I checked him at the door. You don't check God at the door. God's not a hat that you take off and say, when I'm finished with my sin, I'll come back and pick you up. God, the Holy Spirit, lives within us, so whatever we do engages God. Jonah just missed a simple teaching. Psalm chapter 139, verse 7, it says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. C.S. Lewis said it this way in his book, uh, We May Ignore, but we, uh, he said this, uh, and I don't have his book title, I apologize, said this, We may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. That's a great quote by C.S. Lewis. There's nowhere you can go that God's not there. That will change our decision-making, won't it? When we end up showing up somewhere and we think we're getting away with something and we don't find immediate consequences and we think we got by with it. Mm, no, temporary. God was there. God knows. So what else? There was rebellion, there was running, there's rationalization. Rationalization was his approach. Look at verse 3. He found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it. So many people use their circumstances, just like Jonah, to justify their, their decision. Now, he shows up and he finds a ship. Oh, this must be God's plan. Look, he provided a ship. Now, God told us to do one thing. He told you, Jonah, to go to Nineveh. But why would God provide a ship if he didn't want me to go to Nineveh? I mean, go to Tarshish. And there are people in their lives that do the same exact thing. They use the circumstances to justify poor choices. If God didn't want me to do this, why would he have allowed this? If I, I literally heard this one time. If God didn't want me to drink, then why did he let me go into the bar? The guy's name was Rick. I'll never forget the story. He said, I stood outside the door of the bar and I prayed, God, if you're real, don't let me go in. You're not a, a, a puppet, a marionette. God didn't pull your strings. He, give, he gives us a, a choice. Well, if God didn't want me to ha be happy, he wouldn't have brought this other person into my life. If God didn't want me to have this money, he wouldn't have just laid it out there so easy to take. I mean, you put whatever situation in there. 
you can find a reason to justify your decision. I'll guarantee you. And you say, well, God did this. No, I've seen people make really stupid choices and blame God. And I'm going to tell you, God is not in the stupid choice-making business. He gives us the opportunities to make wise choices. Well, if it was wrong, then why would God give me such a peace about it? God's not giving you a peace about it. You've hardened your heart. That's why you're happy. Because the Holy Spirit is not convicting you because you won't allow him. Your heart has become hard. God will never contradict his word. You want to find answers? Go to people that are giving you godly counsel. You find yourself in a mess? Don't go to people that are in the same mess and ask them for their advice. They're in the same position you are. Go to somebody who's in the word that's lived through it or learned from it. Go to them and say, what should I do? Pray with me on this. If you want to run from God, you can always find a ship that's heading to Tarshish. Let me just tell you that this morning. If you choose to go, there will always be a ship. Don't blame God when you find that you're in trouble. Number three on your outline here, God knows your reluctance. So I'm going to ask you this morning, what's your Nineveh? What's God asked you to do? Where has God asked you to carry the gospel? What person has he asked you and led you to talk to about Christ and you're just not doing it yet? What change has he asked you to make in your life in a situation where maybe there's, there's something that you know is, is wrong or immoral and, and he's asking you to change and you're going, God, I'm not doing that. I'm reluctant. I'm making the choice just like Jonah did. I'm running. Well, it all comes back to an attitude, doesn't it? The results in an action. And that's the story of Jonah. So I'm going to give you two things in Scripture here. We call them two. There, there are a lot of these in Scripture, but here are two. Two big buts in Scripture. You ready? Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. But the Lord. Hey, God's trying to get Jonah's attention. Don't miss the story here. Jonah's making a mess of things. God's trying to get his attention. But number two, look at verse 6. But Jonah. Jonah just keeps on digging himself deeper in the, in the hole. God tries to get him out. He keeps digging deeper. You find yourself in sin, you're promised a way of escape. In fact, listen to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with that temptation will also make the, what are those next three words? Way of escape. That you may be able to bear it. Jonah kept digging the hole deeper, and no, but God provided. No, God's giving you opportunities out. Don't keep blaming God. Don't keep running. God loves you too much to let you run. Look at the next point. God loves you way too much. So what does he do? Look at verse 4. Another one. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Immediately I read the verse. I think of the movie Perfect Storm. How many of you ever saw that? most amazing effects. I mean, the ship goes up, and he's going up the wave, and before you know it, man, it's just, it's over. The perfect storm. God sends Jonah a perfect personal storm. As it all comes together, you look Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 in the NLT. It says, for the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one that he accepts as his child. God disciplined Jonah I said, preacher, God does that? I know you don't hear it preach much these days, but yes. God is a loving father who in love disciplines his children because he loves us and doesn't want to leave us in the mess that we're in. So he uses discipline to bring us back. God sent him a storm. What happens? God sends us personal storms for a lot of reasons, to get our attention, to remove idols out of our lives, to, to get our focus back on him. He wants us just to come back. I love this. When we choose to sin, we can expect a storm. Author Tim Keller states it this way. The Bible does not say that every difficulty is the result of sin. So if you're struggling with something right now and you say, hey, is God punishing me for a choice that I've made? The first thing is look and say, D is there sin in my life? If there's not, take that thought off the table. Okay? He says this. Not every uh, the Bible doesn't say that every difficulty is a result of sin, but it does teach that every sin will bring you into difficulty. That's a strong statement. 
So what does God do? He loves them too much to leave in there, so he exposes the sinner. Look there, the sailors, <laughs> they're the sinners. They're praying on deck. The preacher, where was he? He was down below deck. He was sleeping. These guys are up there worried, wondering, praying. They're not even believers. The preacher's down there. I look at that, and I see a picture of a sleeping church. The world knows things are in a mess, and the church is more worried about what color's the carpet, what, how, what's the temperature in the room, what songs are we singing, what Bible verse are we using. It's like, get on deck. Get out of bed and realize around us is a storm that's brewing, and we're arguing over the wrong things. Not us, but the church at large is arguing over the wrong things. Look at verse 5. Then the mariners, they were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship. He had lain down and was fast asleep. You've heard preachers preach these, these sermons on the, the slippery slope of sin, and they're right. It takes you down and down and down and down and down. It's going to take you farther down than you ever want to go. In this passage alone, he went down to Joppa. He went down into the lowest parts of the ship. He went down into the belly of the fish. He goes down into the depths of the sea. This story of Jonah starts out with a rebellious attitude, God, I will not do what you asked me to do. It results in actions that cause him to run away from God rather than to God. And ultimately, he's going down further and further and further. It starts slow and it rapidly declines. He was justifying at the port. God must have sent the ship. He's out in the middle of the sea saying, I'm the sinner, throw me overboard. Things went down fast. Look at verse 6. So the captain came in and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I just see the humor in Scripture. Looking at the church today, can you imagine what, what if God came to us and said, are you seriously arguing about that? Come on, sleeper, wake up. Arise, call upon your God. Even these guys that were not believers were saying, call out to your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. They cast lots on the ship. Jonah lost. Jonah says, hey, how about best two out of three? He does it again. Uh, how about three out of five? He'd do it again. How about six out of ten? I know, not lots. Paper, scissors, rocks. Jonah lost again. They're pulling the, the straws. Who draws the short stick? Guess who? Jonah. The guy can't win. Every single time he is losing over and over and over again. Be sure your sin will find you out. Is God a liar or is Scripture true? Scripture is true and God's no liar. He put it in there, be sure your sin will find you out. You're here today, think, I'm getting away with something. No, you're not. You say, I know God asked me to do this, but, but so far things have been good. I'm telling you, the day's coming. You say, I'm outrunning God. No, you're not. Look at verse 8. Then they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What's your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I, what does it say? Liar. He does not. There's no way that he feared the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. He doesn't. He said, I fear the Lord, but he doesn't. I see this in modern Christianity on a regular basis. People say they fear the Lord, but their lifestyle says, no, they don't. It can't happen. There's an old saying. Uh, when I was in youth ministry, man, it's just one of those things we use with the kids all the time. It says this, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. You want to try that with me? <laughs> Your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. You can tell people all day long anything you want to say, but the reality is that the way that you live your life speaks volumes about what you think about God. And so here's Jonah. He says, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And they're going, buddy, are you serious? How about this one? They ask him the question, what's your occupation? 
<clears throat> I'm a preacher. <laughs> We're on vacation. We're playing golf with this guy, and, and uh, he waited until the last day. And I, I, I just don't tell people what I do when I'm on vacation because they really act weird. If you're playing golf with them or something. And so here's the same guy. My son-in-law later says, did you tell that guy what you did or what you do? I said, yeah, he asked. He said, I could tell. He switched everything. <laughs> He's, he went from all the four-letter words to, gosh, dang it. <laughs> People just act weird when you tell them what you do. But here's Jonah. They ask him, what do you do? What's your occupation? I'm a sorry preacher, right? God used those unsaved people to bring judgment on the preacher. Look at verse 10. Then the men who were exceedingly afraid, who really feared God in that moment, and said to him, why have you done this? We read the scripture so fast, we miss the point. Listen to this now. Understand, these are ungodly people sitting in this, the, on this ship, fearing for their lives. They, they look at the preacher and ask him, why have you done this? Somebody in your family is asking you the same question. You totally screwed up their life by a choice that you made. You uprooted, you lost the income, You've done this, you've done that, you've rebelled against God, and somebody's going to look at you one day and say, why have you done this? Why didn't you choose what God wanted you to do instead of choosing the sin that you thought would make you happy? And they're going to ask you this question. Are you happy? Are you happy? And deep down inside, you're going to know that, yeah, there was a time I was really happy, but that wore off pretty quick. Don't be like this sorry preacher. He said, for the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Even the unsaved people know when we're running from God. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, even though they, he told them what to do, but he was the kind of guy that they're not going to believe him. He's a sorry preacher, a lying preacher. <laughs> Nevertheless, the men rowed hard against the storm and tried to return to land. They're rowing against God. They're going to lose. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us for, uh, with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Throw the preacher overboard. Things calm down. Those guys did exactly what God told them to do. Jonah rebelled. Look at the difference in the results. Running from God and not doing what he told you to do results in a personal storm and a mess. Doing what God tells us to do results in peace and calm. Don't miss that. Some of you are running today. God's asked you to do something or you're engaged in the middle of sin and you're going, oh, it's going to be okay. It's just a matter of time until you get thrown overboard. God's glorified. The storm stops. Look at verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord. These guys that saw what happened, now they feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. God doesn't need the preacher to accomplish his plan. God didn't need Jonah to accomplish his plan. God doesn't need you to accomplish his plan. God didn't need Gideon to accomplish his plan. Another one of my favorite stories. Deborah basically says, hey, I'm giving you the opportunity. If you don't do it, God will use somebody else. How about this? God doesn't need us. We get to serve him. It's our privilege. It's not our right. His work goes on whether we're here or not. People go to heaven whether we're here or not. God is in control, and he doesn't need us. That should be a humbling factor. God didn't need Jonah. God doesn't need us. But he invites us to join him in his work. Hey, don't miss that this morning. There's so much in this passage. We could go on this, this one thing for months. Chapter 1, I'm not going to do it. But 
Don't miss this. God has invited you to join him in his work. He's inviting you. Don't say no. Don't have a rebellious spirit. Don't have a heart that turns away from the Lord. God's inviting you to join him. All you have to do is say yes. You want a storm? Say no. You want to have problems? Say no. You want to cause havoc in your family? Just run from God. You want to be where God wants you to be, enjoying the blessings of obedience. Do what God asks you to do. Then he brings punishment on Jonah. Look at verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and, the, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Here's where people say, is this possible? Are you for real? Could this really, really happen? Now, I'm not stating this as a fact this morning, okay? I want to make sure I clarify this, but, but I just want to show you one possibility. Put that picture up there on the screen for us, if you would. That's a whale shark, all right? Now, it's uh, not actually a shark, but it is the world's largest fish. I want you to think about this for just a minute. These fish can grow to almost 40 feet in length. Their jaws open up to as much as seven feet. I don't know about you, but I'm, I, I could go in sideways, and I'm six feet tall. He wouldn't even have to swallow me straight in. It could take me in sideways. I don't know that that's the fish, and I'm not saying that it is this morning, but I just want to suggest to you the possibility that uh, if you were doubting this story, now maybe you'll think about it a little bit more, because that's exactly where we're going to pick up next week. And I'm telling you, to get through a page and a half, four chapters in this small little book, there is so much meat here, but I just want you to get this this morning as we kind of wrap all of this up. When we live in obedience to God, there are blessings. When we live in disobedience to God, there is discipline. And God's given you a choice this morning. Do you want to live in obedience? And be blessed. Blessed is the man whose God is the Lord. It's up to you. Say, preacher, I, I just, I'm unhappy in life. I, I just don't like all the things that are going on. And I, where are your eyes fixed? On people or on God? You want to live in disobedience? You want to go against everything God's told you? You're the one that has to live with the consequences. But the Bible has told us how to be blessed in this life. I want to encourage you this morning because everybody in this room has the same opportunity. God is no respecter of persons. Uh, contrary to what popular theology teaches, every one of us, I believe, with my, all my heart, has the opportunity to know Jesus as Savior. I believe with all of my heart that, that salvation is a gift that's by grace through faith in Christ. That anybody, anybody, who calls on him can have it. So I want to tell you where this starts this morning. Jonah made a choice. It was a terrible choice. A choice to run from God, but he had a relationship with God. He was a pastor, a preacher, a prophet. He was one that God knew where he was because he, he gave him a task. He gave him an assignment. He told him to carry the message. He told him to go to the most wicked of all people. But he couldn't have done all that if God didn't know who he was. So here's how I'm going to wrap this up this morning. I want to ask you two questions. Number one, are you running from God? If you are, you take time right now and you just kind of make that happen in, in your seat. You come back to the Lord. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for the mess I've made. I don't want to run from you. I want to run to you. Run to the Father. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God is extending the gift of salvation, the offer of salvation to you. All you have to do is receive it. So I want to ask you this morning, if God's word says, blessed is the man whose God is the Lord, if God's word says that whosoever will may come, if God's word says that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what, golfers, you know what that is? It's a mulligan. <laughs> For the rest of you, you know what that is? That's a do-over. <laughs> It's a second chance. You've messed up. You've made some mistakes. We know the rest of the story. We're going to get into it a little bit deeper, but God didn't throw Jonah out. God rescued him, and ultimately he uses him. 
And God can use you this morning. It doesn't matter what mess you've made. I'm going to ask you, would you bow your heads for just a moment? Right there in your seat. If you're running, are you tired of running? Have you seen the mess? Have you learned from your mistake? Are you ready to come back to the Lord? Are you ready to run to the Father? If you are, today's the day. Would you take a moment right there in your seat? I'm not going to ask you to come forward, to get up, raise a hand, none of that. I'm going to ask you right there, with your head bowed humbly before the Lord, with your eyes closed and with a heart of openness and repentance and humility, just to confess and say, God, I've been running. You asked me to do such and such. Maybe God called you into ministry when you were young. Maybe you're supposed to be preaching and, and you've gone off on your own career tangent. Maybe he's asked you to engage in some area of ministry, to reach out to the homeless, to serve in a prison ministry, to teach a Bible study. And, and to this point, you're just saying, no, I'm not doing that. Then right now, you have the opportunity. A loving father is inviting you to run back to him. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, but today you say, God, I want to start that relationship with you. Right there in your seat, in the quietness of your heart, we're going to sing in a moment. And during that verse, cry out to God, God, forgive me. I've done wrong. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to live a life of blessing. God, I know that only comes through Jesus Christ and the blood he shed on the cross of Calvary. And today, I invite him into my life to be my Lord, to be my Savior. You say, preacher, you don't know what I've done. All I can tell you today is this. God wanted Jonah to go to the Ninevites. I described them to you. None of you have been that brutal and cruel. <laughs> There's forgiveness at the foot of the cross. As we sing this song for just a moment, right there in your seat, you do what God's leading you to do. Run to the Father. Run to Him right now. Run to the Father. Fall into grace. Done with the hiding. No reason to wait. The heart needs a surgeon. The soul needs a friend. you this morning are you running back to the father maybe you're running to him for salvation maybe you're running to him because you're coming home you remember the joy of your salvation and just like David cried out God restore to me the joy of thy salvation maybe that's what you need this morning just to, to be rejuvenated in your spirit say yes Lord father thank you for this morning 
privilege that we have to read these stories so that we don't have to make the same mistakes. God, there are some of us in the room that are hard-headed and we're not going to learn from somebody else's mistake. We just want to do it ourselves. And the outcome's going to be the same. The mess is going to be made. We're going to waste a lot of time in our lives. We're going to hurt a lot of people along the way. And ultimately, because you love us and discipline us, hopefully we're going to come back to you and find you right there, just like where the prodigal son left. The father stayed and waited. God, there are also people in this room this morning whose hearts are humble. They're soft to what the Holy Spirit's leading them to do. They made some mistakes. They made some poor choices, but they understand that they can run back to the Father. And what a great story, the story of Jonah, to show the discipline that comes for poor choices and the blessings that come from obedience. Father, if there are those in this room this morning that invited Christ into their life, thank you for that as well. Help them to grow in their faith and to follow faithfully. We pray that in Jesus' name.